Professor Matsukato is the author of three books. Uh, the first was The Entrepreneurial State, uh, Debunking the Private versus the Public Sector uh, Myths, which was published in 2013 and investigated the critical role the state plays in driving growth. Her second in 2018 was The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy, which looked at how value creation needs to be rewarded over um, value extraction. Uh, both of these books were highly acclaimed. And um, to give one uh, recent example of uh, the way that she's regarded, uh, the uh, high profile Reith lectures in December 2020, the recent um, series of them, which was given by uh, Mark Carney, the former governor of Bank of England. Uh, he, in his lecture, acknowledged his debt to Professor Matsukato when he made his assertion that society gives insufficient attention to the moral value of goods and services and too much uh, on their financial worth. I could go on at many others, but that was a fairly recent one um, from uh, somebody that uh, we'd agree has been quite uh, important in the economic uh, of the, the UK over the last uh, many years. Anyway, her latest book published at the end of January has the same title um, as tonight's talk. And uh, having read this book, which is somewhere on my desk here, um, this blue, uh, blue rather uh, interesting book, uh, I reckon that we're in for a very stimulating evening. Um, she's got some fairly plain speaking in her book. Um, and um, this um, sentence uh, on uh, page 137, I'm able to quote, being an accountant, one has to be very precise. Um, this sentence on page 137 is, is aimed straight at me. Um, a vital aspect of a mission oriented approach is to represent different people and perspectives, uh, not just those of the elite experts, often white males in their 60s. <laughs> I need say no more. Uh, Professor Matsukato, welcome. Oh, wow. That was hard hitting. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Thanks so much. And it's especially wonderful to be talking about this theme, of course, in the uh, you know, homeland of, uh, of Adam Smith, where there's so much misunderstanding of what even the market means out there. People stupidly think that you know, the free market means free from the state. Actually, Adam Smith, when he talked about the free market, it was it was free from rent, free from rent seeking. You know all these things that today we know are uh, you know leading to a rising level of uh, inequality and problematic distribution of wealth, which is actually collectively created but often privately owned. And so, what I'd like to do is to Kind of have two sides of this talk. One is about all the problems we're currently facing, and of course we're facing immense problems, um, not just the COVID uh, pandemic, but also the climate crisis and so on. I want to look at the underlying um, structural features of these problems, not just the symptoms of which these crises are, just symptoms. And I want to actually spend most of the time, and I've been given an extraordinary amount of minutes to speak to you, 50, much more than we often get in lectures. I'll try to keep it less than that so we have even more time for Q&A, but I wanna spend most of that time actually on the solutions. And that's what the book actually tries to focus on. I've been working uh, with governments globally, including the Scottish government. I'm a, one of the advisors of Nicola Sturgeon and the Council of Economic Advisors. We're actually meeting tomorrow for three hours. So great that this is the aperitivo, I'm Italian, so I think of it as an aperitivo to the cena, aperitivo to the dinner, um, about these issues, about how do we bring purpose, public purpose, and public value to the center of how we actually think about our economy, but especially the center of how we design uh, a public policy, so the political economy. Um, so on that, let me just begin, given that my screen share is already on, which is useful. Um, first, just a bit about the context. I've already mentioned a bit about it. You know, the COVID moment, the COVID crisis, the tragedy that globally people are living through in different ways, because we know that it's also distributed in different ways, has really thrown an immense amount of problem solving to countries, you know, whether it's the test and trace system, which in the UK we decided to roll out through a consulting company, Deloitte and others, whether it's the vaccine rollout, which again, in the UK, we've 
luckily decided to roll out through the public health system, whether it's the digital divide. I've got four children and I know that their ability currently to access their human right to education is very different from many uh, children and students globally, but also in the UK, even in London that are you know, much less lucky than they are in terms of the uh, uh, social economic kind of background that they come from. Um, so these are all problems that need to be solved. And it's, it's quite extraordinary just how badly, let's just use you know, really simple words, uh, you know, we've confronted this crisis globally. And at the same time, differences between countries and how they've confronted it. I was very interested in how even developing countries like Vietnam or Kerala, a particular state in India, have actually succeeded more than some very rich developed countries precisely because they've been investing actually within their state institutions or what we might call the public administration. Um, anyway, there's differences, let's just put it that way. And you know, this is a real learning moment. What can we learn about the strength or the lack of strength of global health systems that is absolutely required in order to govern a crisis of this size? And you know, in the end, it's not gonna be solved by any one actor, whether it's business investing in vaccines or public sectors investing in vaccines or the public sector governing problems of the rollout of test and trace, or you know, it's not one actor, business or government or philanthropies that are gonna solve it. It really requires a new thinking about partnership, but partnership that's concrete in terms of delivering the things we actually need, you know, on a daily basis. And yet again, a, a, a real wakening up moment of just how badly prepared we've been. Um, you know, we call them essential workers, but most essential workers are not deemed essential at all in terms of how we value them in GDP. And I'll come back to that later. Um, and before this crisis hit us and during and after, of course, we've had the climate crisis. And, you know, uh, uh, February of last year, uh, so February 2020, the TV screens and the newspapers were not of uh, frontline workers in hospitals, but frontline workers fighting fires. And you'll remember in both Australia and California, or where I'm from, which is the Veneto part of Italy, Venice was, you know, had that huge problem around the floods. And all these are kind of symptoms of climate change. And yet we're not getting any closer to solving that. Greta Thornburg, when she was 16, now she's 18 said, you know, if your house is on fire, what do you do? You don't just sit there and debate, hmm, what should I do? What's the theory you're gonna tell me of what to do? You get the hell out. <laughs> and we're simply not getting out of this crisis fast enough. Um, I've got some numbers here that are, you know, bewildering and just last year, $55 billion uh, worth or euros worth. I'm not sure why I have dollars here for the EU, but anyway, uh, 55 billion in subsidies were given to fossil fuel companies in the EU and also 56% of the COVID-19 recovery funds in the G20 countries given to energy companies have gone to, enter to a fossil fuel project. So, you know, the truth is we simply are not getting out of that house that's burning. We are simply burning it with different types of uh, materials and transforming, uh, you know, just kind of redistributing where the problems are. And so really what I want to do in the next part of this talk is to say, you know, these are just symptoms. These are symptoms of how unprepared we've been in terms of our public institutions. They're symptoms of how uh, our corporate governance systems are extremely problematic, focusing on short-term returns and really demolishing really biodiversity in our planet along the way. Um, but why do we need deep change? We need to understand the structural foundations of these problems. And let me just spend a bit of time on this. And then I promise most of the lectures on the positive side and the solutions and what to do about all this. So in terms of what's wrong, I've broken this down into three or four points. The first is finance, right? You know, there's all sorts of different actors in the economy. Markets are outcomes of how we shape finance, how we shape business, how we shape government, how their interrelationships are structured. And on the finance bit, we simply have a huge problem, which is that finance has been financing finance. <laughs> uh, so this graph here is from the Bank of England showing just how much finance, insurance, and real estate, FIRE is the acronym, coming back to the previous images of our forests burning, um, but in, in the sense it's financialized FIRE. Uh, in the UK, something like 80% of our uh, finance goes 
uh, back to the financial sector, only 20% of it goes into the real economy. And this is very much seen in this graph here from the Bank of England, which shows you the rise of financial intermediation compared to the rest of the economy. And this has been also uh, galvanized, or how do you say, catalyzed, and wrongfully uh, uh, um, you know, uh, um, come into being from how we have also structured, in some cases, our uh, responses to different types of crises. Even now, with these help to buy schemes, you know, why would you want to help people buy homes when they can't afford those homes because their incomes have not been rising for the last 30 years? So really the problem should be more on the supply side, getting more affordable homes out there, not getting people to think they can through help to buy schemes and you know, financializing that, uh, their, their ability to buy and never pay it back. And you know, what's interesting is we often misunderstand public debts and think that it's the same thing as a household income saying, you know, can you actually afford to pay it back? And I can come to that if you want in the Q&A, but it is true for households. If you're gonna be buying stuff like homes, you better over the next kind of five, 10, 20 years at least be able to pay that back. Instead, if your real incomes aren't rising, that's a problem. And in fact, private debt, not public, private debt to disposable income is at record levels in the UK um, and in, in um, the US as well. And this is part of the financialized uh, uh, um, characteristic of our economy. Um, the second problem is what's happening to the real economy, right? I was saying there's not enough finance even going to the real economy. Uh, well, that, that do does go to the real economy and how we have our businesses structured globally is incredibly extractive. My previous book called The Value of Everything, which, uh, yeah, Mark Carney, thank you, Richard, for mentioning that, very much based his first re lecture on distinguishing objective versus subjective theories of value and looking at what happens when we confuse price with value. Um, you know, this is, this is very much a symptom of that, that when you have a real economy, by that I mean companies that have factories, that have, you know, production, that are producing and hire workers, when those companies are not focused on the long run and are not reinvesting their profits back into production, but are actually extracting it through practices like share buybacks, we've got an even greater problem. This figure here is from the work of Bill Lazonic, who's shown that over the last uh, 10 years, over $4 trillion have been used by the top 500 companies globally just to buy back their shares, to boost their stock prices, to boost their stock options, to boost, surprise, surprise, executive pay. Um, and this is a deep structural problem, which is, has also been rewarded. You know, the fact that we actually have a tax system, an incentive system that has allowed that is, is very much part of the problem. And this is why, you know, in, in illuminated circles now and then you hear a business saying they need to change away from this short term maximization of shares towards a, a broader maximization of stakeholder values. So investing back into workers training programs, communities, and planet. The problem is this isn't really leading to much change. I mean, you can look at all the different metrics. We're not actually getting this kind of new type of business model. It's sometimes there, but more in terms of corporate social responsibility or ESG environment and sustainability kind of a, a, a targets inside companies, but it hasn't gone to the center of how we actually create wealth in the first place. So we don't have to you know, just redistribute and pick up the mess afterwards. And this brings me to the third problem, which is government. <laughs> it's not just corporate governance that's a problem. It's government governance that's a problem. Governments have at the best, you know, at the worst bought into Reagan's point, which is get the hell out of the way, at the best bought into the more progressive notion that yes, of course you're important, but you're only important to fix market failures. Uh, so you actually have to wait for things to screw up until you come in. And by definition, you will always be too little, too late. So if climate change is seen as a negative externality that requires a patch on the system like a carbon tax, okay, fine, we would very much welcome more carbon taxes, but is it really just a patch in the system that we need? Or if great things like basic research and you know, clean water are seen as public goods that are confronting the opposite problem, which is positive externalities where you don't have enough government investment, so pollution is maybe too much bad investment, uh, uh, these public goods are too little investment in them, if they're seen as simply fixing a positive externality problem, again, important, but can you really patch your way, bandage your way 
you know, out of the current system, which has just these real kind of structural flaws? Um, and the answer is no. I've been arguing we need a market shaping and a market creating framework, not a market fixing one. And, you know, recently there was a, a Tory Lord, Agnew, this is his face here, um, uh, who said something that I found so interesting because I've been arguing it for a long time, but I didn't have that vocabulary that he used or that word he used, which he's, he, he, you know, he said, when governments don't understand their role, they end up outsourcing everything. And look at both Brexit and COVID, massive outsourcing and the billions of government capacity, and then they kind of get it wrong. And he said, this has been infantilizing the public sector. And I thought it was such an interesting way to frame the problem that if you don't even get your role as going beyond market fixing, putting words in his mouth, but that's okay, um, then you, you, you actually don't make the investments within uh, government institutions to create the kind of value that you need, but you also lose the ability to do so. You lose what in the business literature they call absorptive capacity. It sounds very fancy, but it really literally means kind of that strategic ability to understand your environment and to have the capabilities and capacity to help kind of govern it. Um, so in one part of the book, which um, thank you, Richard, for showing, this is the UK version, the US version, which is orange, <laughs> just is coming out in a couple of weeks. I go through all the different myths actually which are assumptions, they're theoretical assumptions that have led to this problematic understanding of what government is for. Um, and you know, I, I went through the kind of initial problems that we're facing as symptoms, you know, the COVID crisis, climate change, massive kind of symptoms of these problems, but they're symptoms of a problem where all the different actors in the system from finance, business, government are not only governed problematically, but especially relate to each other in problematic ways. And in that chapter in the book where I go through these myths, I look at value, markets, concepts of efficiency, problematic concepts of efficiency, uh, you know, capabilities, where do we really think they reside and directionality of the economy. Um, and I look at them as myths in terms of the underlying problematic ways that we think about these. So if we think of value as just being created in business and then being facilitated and enabled by say government, that already sets up the kind of confidence of these actors in a very different way. And actually value is co-created. It's created by workers. It's created by trade unions, which by the way, got us something really great, which is the weekend in the eight hour workday. Markets are outcomes of how all these different organizations in the public, private and civil society sector are governed and interrelate. Markets, you know, the idea, I already mentioned this, the purpose of governments is simply to fix markets. That's a complete myth. <laughs> uh, what actually, um, you know, we've required to even get us things like the internet, <laughs> uh, which was government finance, was um, oh, by doing that, I now no longer see what, uh, what have I done? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, we no longer, uh, um, sorry, just by having you know, this idea that markets are there to be fixed and we wouldn't have had the internet, which was government finance, which created markets or the BBC, really important you know, public institution, which in the UK has been an active market co-creator. So seeing markets as outcomes. Efficiency, this idea that governments at best should be um, you know, run as uh, 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 the private sector become more efficient and precisely in that way, perhaps be outsourced this next point in order to run it more efficiently. These are all based on problematic underlying assumptions of how we understand the role of these actors. And if you're not seen as an active creator of value, why bother? Why bother investing in your own knowledge creation, your absorptive capacity? your ability to co-create as opposed to just fix. So you end up not actually having the capabilities to do things. So it becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy that then you need to be privatized. Um, and you know, the last point there in directionality, the fact that the economy has not just a rate, but a direction. Growth has not just a rate, but a direction. Even financialization is a direction of the kind of growth we've had. The fact we don't talk about that and have words like, the role of policy is to level the playing field as opposed to tilt it towards directions of greater inclusion and sustainability means that we end up having all these kind of you know problematic and kind of bogus ways that we think of the role of government again as leveling and it shouldn't pick winners it should just kind of sit in the background and you know facilitate and then step away to allow business to to direct the show and you know what i often have talked about is yes we shouldn't pick winners in terms of particular types of technologies and you know, sectors and types of firms, but surely we need to pick a direction at least, right? You pick a direction towards where we wanna go 
And then you pick the willing, who's actually willing to move with you in that direction. But you still need to make that choice. That's a directional choice. And this is why I wrote the book. Um, you know, we simply would not have 51 years ago, almost 51 years ago, gone to the moon and back, which was extremely hard, had we bought into all those assumptions. <laughs> Um, and actually the problems we're facing today, the social problems around inequality, around weak health systems, around climate change, are even harder than going to the moon. A colleague of mine at Columbia University, Dick Nelson, wrote a book back in 1977 called The Moon and the Ghetto, precisely on that problem. You know, how come we still have ghettos and yet we went to the moon? Well, what is it that we've done wrong on earth that we somehow got right when it was all kind of, you know, really clear of how to beat the Russians? So what I wanna do in the next part is to kind of remember what actually happened when we went to the moon. <laughs> it's not a cut and paste job. I will repeat as I do in the book constantly that the social problems that we have today are more difficult than going to the moon. But actually what was really interesting was what it required you know, in terms of public sector leadership, not micromanaging. This is not about you know, the Soviet Union or as one review, which I, you know, I'm going to be frank, I don't think the reviewer read it, uh, talked about as, oh, this is about, you know, the great leap forward. It's not about that. It's about how do you have government leading and really crowding in as much bottom up interaction around, uh, you know, different sectors, but also public, private, and really interacting in an ambitious way, but with that government setting the direction of what we're trying to do. What it means for risk taking and innovation, agility and flexibility of the organizations involved the ability to kind of aim big, but to allow lots of spillovers to happen along the way, like everything that came out of this, you know, that makes our iPhone smart today and not stupid, frankly, came from these kinds of uh, investments that I'll be speaking about. How to think about budgets, focus on outcomes instead of thinking, oh, where's the money gonna come from? Well, what are you even trying to do? And then back up and ask yourself what kind of budget you need and the really dynamic partnerships that are required to make that happen. Um, you know, and so what's really interesting, just kind of backing up a bit here, when Kennedy made the speech in 1962 in Rice Stadium, they had no clue how to get to the moon. <laughs> I mean, it was really an act of confidence. Um, and in fact, he, he said it, he said, you know, this is gonna be hard and we're gonna do it not because it's easy, because, but because it's hard. Um, you know, imagine if people said that today or leaders today said, we're gonna fight climate change, not because it's easy, but it's hard. We're gonna actually waste a lot of money along the way. We're gonna make mistakes, but it's okay because the, you know, the ambition is great. And so they had even all these different ideas of how to get there. They finally decided on that lunar orbit rendezvous way. Uh, but you know, it took huge amounts of risk-taking and experimentation and willingness to make mistakes. Today, if you're a civil servant, you make a mistake, bang, you're in the front page of the Daily Mail, right? So what does it mean to really welcome that risk-taking and experimentation within public institutions that are ambitious? They also realized very soon that they had to change their structure. It was way too kind of vertical. Uh, this is a, a, um, a figure here from George Mueller who had come from Bell Labs to help uh, you know, with the Apollo program and realized that we de they needed much more horizontal communication, that kind of flexibility and agility. And what was quite striking was in 1967 when the Apollo 1 fire occurred where the three astronauts died, Gus Grissom, you know, literally minutes before or probably an hour before dying, it just kind of yelled, Jesus Christ, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between our own units, right, within NASA, right? We're, we're, we're trying to get up there and our earthly structures within our public institutions are so kind of siloed and, and, and badly communicating, which is such an important point for, you know, many civil servants who, as, as good as they are and as much as they'd love to be creating change will often complain about the siloed structure of government. But the other thing was because actually it fostered so much innovation across many different sectors, it wasn't just aeronautics, it was also innovation in materials and electronics in um, uh, uh, nutrition, the whole software industry in some ways came out of that. It really created lots of earthly, if you want, uh, innovations that were spillovers from that, from camera phones to home insulation to baby formula and so on. Um, and one of the things I found the most interesting, and I actually focus on this quite a bit in the book, is what it meant for the way that business and government actually interacted. Because this word partnership or ecosystems, if you're a kind of a, a policy wonk, 
are often used, but we never ask ourselves, what kind of partnership do we actually have? You know, is it a symbiotic mutualistic partnership or do we have kind of predator prey parasitic partnerships, for example, in the health sector? You know, the PFI schemes, this is way pre-COVID, they were problematic. There was a partnership, why did it go wrong? So what's interesting when I looked into this is, you know, NASA was very confident. They were like, of course we have to partner with business. There's gonna be lots of innovation inside business as we need inside the public sector, but we need capabilities to do that. And we need to make sure that the contracts, literally the procurement contracts, so government to purchase in, um, you know, things that it needs in order to go to the moon, the contracts themselves need to be goal oriented, but also not just inflating the costs uh, uh, for the government. And so they moved away from the cost plus uh, contracts to fixed price contracts with incentives towards innovation. And they included in the contracts, no excess profits, which was so interesting because in this amazing mission that was you know, uh, 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 co-created, invested in by lots of different actors, the idea is you don't just socialize the risks, you socialize the rewards, you know, something we're completely getting wrong. And I'll come back to this later today in the digital uh, world and the health sector and so on. But, and, and NASA paid attention to that. It's, it's part of that Apollo story that no one's really kind of uh, gone into. Um, and, and also they realized that in order to interact with business, which they have to, of course, you need both actors as part of that solution, they themselves needed to be dynamic. And there was this wonderful quote from Ernest Brackett at the time, the head of procurement from NASA saying, we need to be aware to not just be conned into brochuremanship. You know, today that would be the PowerPoints of consulting companies like Deloitte uh, and PwC and so on. But basically the idea was we need to know what the hell we're doing, what we wanna do. And even if the private sector is gonna do part of it with us, we need to understand that landscape. And we're not gonna do that unless we ourselves are smart. We can't just outsource our brain. We need to be investing inside public administration. The point I made about Vietnam and Kerala, just getting this to be a bit less Euro and, and, and US centric for a minute. Um, and, you know, it costs a lot of money, but, you know, he was also clear it would cost a lot of money and yet less than we pay for cigarettes and cigars every year, he took note to, to say. But even without that comparison, the point really is not so much that it costs a lot of money, but how it was structured. It landed, it wasn't extracted, it wasn't just money flown in through helicopters, helicopter money, money trees. It was money that was landing on particular structures and relationships. And this is a big lesson because in the financial crisis, there was a lot of stimulus that went back into the economy. Most of that, as I mentioned in the beginning, ended up back in the financial sector, didn't land on new structures that actually strengthened the economy. So the Apollo you know, program cost a lot of money, but it went into different types of activities, services and goods that were required and relationships and collaborations. And if we ask, what does that mean to, to really focus on that for the social, again, problems that we have, I'll again, not only come back to it, but just to say now that's incredibly important. A country like Italy, where I'm from, our debt to GDP is very high, but the deficit is not high. The deficit in fact has been lower than Germany's for many years. Um, and yet, if you're not investing through public and private investment over in the long run and in actually innovative structures, you don't have enough kind of ambitious mission oriented investments, you can have a mild deficit, but a high debt to GDP because that denominator is not growing. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing how even now, right, with the budget in the UK, there's all this talk of how are we going to pay, you know, this debt back when actually, as long as the focus is on the long run, and investing in critical structure, social infrastructure, physical infrastructure, but especially the kind of innovations of the future that can solve our societal challenges like the digital divide I mentioned in the beginning. In theory, that's gonna create growth, which is the denominator of the debt to GDP. We also want that growth to be sustainable and not be damaging our planet. And that's that issue around directionality, which I'll come to in now. <laughs> So, you know, learning from the moon landing, which is uh, what the book's about, um, but applying it to the earth shots we have today, not the moon shots, the earth shots, that requires both learning those lessons I just went through, but actually changing them quite a bit because the 17 sustainable development goals that you see on the screen here, which were agreed on and signed up to by almost every country in the world, that really requires, um, you know, thinking about these lessons in a way that are even more deep coming back to that uh, 
the moon in the ghetto book that my colleague wrote. These require behavioral change, regulatory change, social change, but also lots of public and private uh, investment and collaborating in specific ways. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is that for the last years, I've been working with governments worldwide on the idea underlying the book. And then I wrote the book to make it more common or more, how do you say, understandable for normal people <laughs> uh, like my family and not just the academics and business leaders that I was talking to and policymakers. You know, it's, it's, it's something that everyone should be able to get inspired by. What I've been working on is how do we transform these 17 SDGs? Again, let me just show them to you again. They've all been agreed to since 2015, 17 goals, every country's agreed to them, 169 targets below them, whether it's no poverty, zero hunger, you know, clean water and sanitation, life below water, et cetera. What does it mean to actually have a plan to confront them, you know, to turn them into these earth shots inspired also by something we did 51 years ago? And that requires beginning with the challenges, which are the SDGs, turning them into missions, which are concrete targets that we can actually answer yes or no, did we achieve them? But structuring it in such a way, as I mentioned with the Apollo program that really galvanize as much intersectoral investment and innovation. As I mentioned, the Apollo program was not just aeronautics. It also required lots of investment in nutrition, materials, electronic software, and the design coming back to that procurement point I made about NASA, design procurement and grants and loans and recovery funds under COVID to foster as much bottom-up innovation to actually fuel experimentation towards um, the goal, the mission. So less focus on sectors, more focus on the problem and how to design industrial strategy, procurement and so on to, to, to uh, reward the experimentation that we need to get there. So whether we're talking about SDG 13 or SDG 14, clean oceans, climate change and so on, we can transform these into concrete goals. You know, plastic free ocean or 100 carbon neutral European cities by 2030. These were two examples I worked out in that report. On the back of that report, missions actually became a legal instrument in Europe. Uh, today, they're part of the Horizon uh, uh, program, which is a, a close to eight, 80 billion now uh, Euro innovation program. But if you just look at, for example, the you know carbon neutral city, this is about you know, really thinking not about carbon neutrality just in terms of renewable energy, but also in terms of changes to real estate, construction materials, food, mobility systems, and so on. And very specific projects, whether they're, sorry, the projects are not specific. You need to then foster experimentation by multiple actors to come up with these projects of which many will fail as Kennedy himself uh, admitted, whether they be carbon neutral urban food industry, uh, projects, carbon citizen, sorry, citizen carbon ID, uh, buildings with carbon neutral components or different types of insurance policies, for example, that would bring us towards a more uh, a carbon neutral low emission um, structures in our uh, economies. Um, and the criteria really for missions to really be kind of moonshots, but on earth, they have to be bold and inspirational, you know, a clear direction, ambitious, well, realistic, it can't be completely pie in the sky. Uh, and really foster that cross-sectoral interdisciplinary interaction and be designed in such a way that can drive you know, multiple bottom-up solutions, which I keep emphasizing. In a second report, I also looked at all the you know, changes we need and how we finance, how we structure our public banks or public funds. The UK government is about to come up with a national infrastructure bank. What is that gonna look like if it actually cares about things like you know, climate change. In Scotland, I worked closely actually with Nicola Sturgeon on a, a, a new public bank called the Scottish National Investment Bank and very much warned not to do what some public banks do, which is just hand out money to whichever company, you know, yells the loudest. What does it mean to have a mission oriented public financial institution, but also the flexibility and adaptability that I talked about in the beginning, the accountability, um, but also, you know, who decides? Who decides what the missions are? Is it really just a minister because it's going to look good in terms of their legacy? Or how can we bring citizens to the table to really engage, um, you know, uh, 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 policy makers in terms of what even matters? You know, who decides what is societally relevant and, and inspirational? And it's interesting coming back to that plastic free ocean one. So many people know about the plastic free ambition and mission because not of a minister, an academic, or a business leader, but because of David Attenborough's Blue Planet, 
documentary where that last episode was on, you know, all the plastic that's flooding our, um, our seas and the baby dolphins choking on it, et cetera. It, it took a creative output, right? So what does it mean to bring the creative sector to the table, the humanities and so on to help us to reframe, how do we want to live together? Um, as I mentioned on the back of this work, the EU, forget Brexit for a minute, just pretend we're all there happily together in Europe, uh, came up with these five mission areas, um, which currently they have also mission boards thinking about multiple missions underneath each one. Um, I'll just move on quicker. In the uh, UK government, I worked closely with Greg uh, Clark, who is the Minister of Business, Environment and Industrial Strategy to help the industrial strategy be less about a list of sectors. At the time, under Vince Cable, before that, it was uh, the sectors were aeronautics, aeros sorry, aeronautics, automobiles, financial services, creative sector, and life sciences. And I said, to do what? <laughs> so help them make this more challenge-oriented um, industrial strategy around four big areas like clean growth, future mobility. And we set up, myself and David Willits, we co-chaired a commission uh, mission-oriented industrial strategy, looking at, for example, at future of mobility, what would it mean if we had really clear missions around mobility that was universally accessible, uh, you know, uh, so that anyone could access, whether it's the tube or any other part of our infrastructure, but also sustainable. And that would, of course, require some of those bottom-up projects to also come from the world of disabilities. Um, currently, one of the interesting things I'm doing is working in Camden, which is where I live. You can't see because it's dark, but I am in Camden, a council in London, around nesting these missions within you know, areas like youth centers, social housing. So having a carbon neutral mission, which is about making our housing estates uh, sustainable or school meals sustainable. Imagine in Manchester, we have Marcus Rashford reminding the government we need school meals during lockdowns. Well, what if those school meals weren't just provided, which of course they should be. We owe our gratitude to him to remind the government of their role, but also a locus of innovation, you know, the production, the distribution, the consumption of school meals to be as sustainable, healthy, and tasty, of course, as possible and bringing students to the table to help design those, but also to monitor the outcome. If they're not tasty, then they're not gonna eat them, right? Um, I also work you know, closely with the Italian government, uh, the previous one before the recent resignation, precisely because currently, not, be, not many people realize this, but the European recovery scheme, which is called the Next Gen EU recovery for COVID, it's close to a trillion. It's not as much as it should be. The US government, which is almost as large, well, the US and Europe are equal, if you want, in terms of size of their GDPs almost. And the US is spending 1.9 trillion on their recovery. Europe is spending uh, 1 trillion. Of course, we need to also look at national uh, responses, but it's conditional on governments coming up with a strategy around both climate change and digital, digitalization. So I work closely with the Italian government on this concept of mission saying, you can't just talk about digital or climate change. You need some you know, really concrete missions around that. So we worked around this digital divide one. Um, but again, you know, all these things really are more creative and more interesting and more inspirational when they land on actors that together can negotiate and co-create and co-design these missions. That's why cities, by the way, are so interesting because uh, they're more local. It's kind of easier actually to think about what it means to bring something like the future of mobility to the fore of how citizens, whether they're, you know, where, where they're living, but also at the street level and how the city plans mobility from point A to point B, how they can be the, the funnel for lots of innovation. Um, I'm almost done here. So I just wanna say, you know, the pushback I get, and I get a lot when I talk about this stuff is the usual. So let me just finish with some of the, you know, what, you know, why we need to resist the usual pushback. However, we sh I should at least engage with it. But, you know, this is not about mo more money, more money, more money. This is about a very different way of thinking about government's role, even with the existing money it has. It is true, there's been lots of cuts to things like public services. And you know, if you think of public health systems, and I do think we need more money there, but it's not just about that. It is about actually structuring you know, public subsidies, guarantees, procurement, grants and loans really in a different way to really catalyze that additionality, that investment across the economy towards goals that actually matter. So it's not about money trees, it's about smarter trees. <laughs> it's not about picking winners. You know, it is about picking directions, being very clear on what those directions are. And I do think we're committed to these SDGs. Let's go for them. 
we've signed up to them, should take our names off if we're not serious. And how do we tilt the playing field, you know, reward those kind of companies that really are making those long run investments that are reducing their carbon emissions. So this is the Concord plane, which is often used as the example of where government screws up. Well, I'm not talking about the Concord plane. I'm talking about, you know, really using government policy to help direct and steer an economy and catalyze as much bottom up innovation by multiple actors, not just one big isolated infrastructure project like HS2 or, or Concord. Um, it's not about ideology. This is not about communism. I mean, you know, forget whether one likes communism or not. That's not the point. This is about doing capitalism better. It's about taking seriously this idea that we can do capitalism in different ways. And there's all this talk about stakeholder capitalism, but we're simply not doing it. It's just this fluffy thing that makes some companies feel better. But we need to bring that notion of stakeholder value and purpose at the center of the system, at the center of how public, private, and other actors interact. It's about solving problems together. Coming back to the SDGs, which present to us 169 different problems if you look at the targets below them. Um, and it's also about making sure we govern the system in the public interest, even the vaccine. It sounds good, you know, we have vaccines, we have public and private investment, but if we don't govern the rollout in, in, in the way that it needs to be governed, if we don't govern the intellectual property rights, to really fuel what the World Health Organization calls collective intelligence and allow patents to constantly just create these rent seeking kind of areas, then we failed, right? So it's not just about putting the money in, but governing a system in order actually to meet people's needs. Um, and, and I do, I've been writing about this for a long time, how we've gotten this wrong in health where there's huge amounts of public money on say medicines and yet the prices of the medicines don't reflect that. You have taxpayers paying once, twice, three times just to get back what they've actually uh, helped co-finance. Um, and also, this is one of my last slides, in France, what was interesting was the, the Minister of Finance, who you see here, he was very clear. He said, uh, he said um, we're not here just to bail out companies. We want to help transform them. And so the, con you know, the conditions that were attached to the COVID-19 recovery schemes um, for airlines and automobiles were conditional on those sectors reducing their carbon emissions. Or in Denmark and Austria, similarly, they said, um, you can't use tax havens. And Sc the Scottish parliament has voted to block companies based in tax havens from using millions of pounds in coronavirus relief funding. Um, so you can't just you know, use ta for tax havens, you can't just use it for share buybacks and so on. This is about conditionality. And I don't like the word conditionality, it reminds us of the Washington consensus kind of language, but it really is about building a better social contract between all the different value creating actors. And when you have a huge recovery scheme just kind of going into the system without nesting it within this different public purpose symbiosis, mutualistic way of doing things that again, NASA worried about, then it's, it's, it's a failed opportunity. Um, and this also, you know, it's not just about health as I've been talking about obviously coronavirus, but you know, as I mentioned, everything in our iPhones or smartphones, whatever phone we have that makes it smart and not stupid was actually publicly financed, you know, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, my two books ago, I wrote about that in the entrepreneurial state. But if we then don't govern that technology to benefit citizens, you know, just because you can search Google, that's not enough. If Google's also searching you <laughs> without you knowing, you got a problem. So how do we govern the data commons? And the city of Barcelona recently, the, the mayor, Ada Colau, um, brought in all these uh, hackers into the city government, which is quite interesting in order to govern how data actually benefits the city. Um, data is created every time you click on city mapper or anything. When that data is created, we often just assume, of course, it goes to the private sector. So this was a, a, a hacking unit within the government that said, no, no, the data is coming back to us and we're going to use it to improve public transport, social housing, and so on. And you know, the, the point that I made about the moon in the ghetto is extremely important. We shouldn't forget this. Um, this is not about some, again, micromanaged top-down process. It has to be about you know, different voices at the table. And the fact we have all these movements in the last year or two, you know, with the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, um, Fridays for the Future, you know, what does it mean to really listen to these voices that are saying, you know, we need to get our acts together. Uh, this this, this uh, song, poem by Jill Scott Heron, Whitey's on the Moon, you know, he was saying, we're going to the moon, this was back in the 60s, and we can't even get food on the table for so many people on earth. 
And while that's a very good question that, you know, if you look back at that spillover slide I had, a lot of the earthly goods we have have actually come from going to the moon, the, the, the goods that have helped us actually confront disease um, and also poverty worldwide, but that doesn't happen just by chance, it happens if we care. And unfortunately we don't care enough. We're not working enough to make sure that science is actually really benefiting the people that need it. Again, that example of the vaccine, it's not enough to have it if then you have vaccine apartheid where you know 80% of uh, you know, countries actually haven't yet gotten access as much as the 20% rich uh, countries. So what does it mean to think about distribution kind of ex ante? you know, not just redistribution, pre-distribution, get the relationships right, battle the structural inequalities, the structural racism from the beginning so we don't have to pick up the mess afterwards. And that's a very important part, I think, of a mission setting. Um, at the end of the book, this is my last slide, I talk about why all these issues I've talked about really should lead to a new political economy, right? I began with Adam Smith's political economy, new approach to value as collectively created, markets as shaped, organizations in the public sector and private sector requiring dynamic capabilities. You can't just outsource your way to any problem. Finance, you know, what does an outcomes-based notion of finance look like? Pre-distribution, so we actually share risks and rewards and don't just have to do that later via taxation, but we need progressive taxation. Purpose at the center of partnerships, not just a corporate governance motto, and real true participation um, you know, bringing in those, that kind of citizen-led design in places like uh, that, that example I gave of Camden. And a completely new vocabulary, again, of what policy is for. It's not about fixing, but co-creating. It's not about de-risking, welcome welcoming uncertainty, not about picking winners, picking the willing. All these different words here are really why I set up an institute at University College London called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, where the idea is we need a new training. We need a new curriculum for global bureaucrats. We can't just get better policy. We need a new mindset and lots of these new words of welcoming uncertainty, being willing to make mistakes. No one's gonna learn without learning by doing, but that requires both a new narrative, a new story and a new framing. Um, and I'm done, thank you. My clock died halfway through, so I have no idea if I'm, what time I've made here, but I will stop now. We've had uh, plenty of questions, so thank you very much, um, everybody. I think um, one or two um, have, have focused on uh, the question of uh, the environment, and I'm wondering if we could perhaps start with them. Um, our population, uh, one of the anonymous attendees of which we've got quite a few, our population size is too large and we don't have enough sustainable resources to support it and destroying the planet as a result. Um, how can societies prosper uh, with this elephant in the room? You know, that's a big question and it's a very important one because you'll notice that I mentioned growth a lot <laughs> during the talk, even when I say, you know, it's not just a rate of growth, but there's a direction of growth. What I'm getting at, and perhaps I should say much more explicitly, is we have had a direction of growth, which is killing our planet. It's, you know, hurting animals, which is, is very much part of the COVID pandemic. You know, if you look at the kind of viruses that are coming our way, because we're, you know, hurting the kind of biodiversity, but also we are getting exposed to uh, certain animals that we, I mean, this is some, a recent article that I looked at in terms of what we're doing to the Amazon is actually putting us in touch with certain types of creatures that we, we are just simply not ready to confront. And we, we have not prepared our, uh, our bodies for that. And that is because we are decimating, you know, the rainforest, we are becoming closer to certain types of um, um, animals which harbor these viruses and that's very much what also happened in the Wuhan market with bats so how we're treating animals how we're treating the biodiversity in terms of the plants um, how we're treating the planet and generally in terms of all the climate change problems I talked about in the beginning you know this is a particular type of growth there's nothing inevitable in that even even deregulation is a particular type of growth it's an act of you know it's an outcome of a particular type of decisions that we've made in the economy so I think you know, the whole question about, um, about the planet is really reminding us that there's decisions we have to make. So this is not about, oh, just throw a lot of public money at you know, making things happen, goods and services in the economy. This is particular types of goods and services in the economy. And so a mission-oriented approach would think very carefully, for example, about how handouts are provided to some of the sectors that today really need funding 
not just because of the COVID pandemic, but because they're kind of dying sectors. So if you look at the steel sector, which globally is asking for handouts, um, it's very interesting to see those differences in how governments are confronting that. And if you have a, a, a lack of emission, which I would agree, or I would argue the UK government, for example, has not really been directed towards a particular type of economy, then the way it interacts with steel will be simply through a deal, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, agreement that is about helping the steel sector. Whereas in Germany, where they had a very clear uh, energy vendor mission, the way that the public bank, the KFW interacted with steel was to put a conditionality that steel had to reduce um, its carbon emissions, had to reduce its material content, which they in fact did through repurpose, reuse, recycle, which was, you know, then they became one of the greenest, you know, steel sectors uh, in the world. And that's not because they talked about purpose, but they had to in order to get government money. So in terms of the planet and our planetary boundaries, we need to reflect on what that means for the everyday normal stuff in terms of how any penny of subsidy, guarantee, grant, loan, or bailout during the COVID recovery gets administered. And I really believe that we can redirect our economy to be more sustainable. There's some who think, no, this is just about limiting growth. We only have a certain amount of resources. I, I, I think that's not true. And I think that's where there's a big debate on that. We can change the types of resources we have. We can put these resources together. We can collaborate in different ways that can make us more sustainable. It's not about saying only certain number of people can live on this planet. Mm -hmm. But a, a that's my opinion. Sort of, yeah, a similar sort of follow up one, which was uh, thank you for the lecture. With respect to climate change, we have a clear purpose. We know where we want to get to, but we seem incapable of identifying a common path. Is this due to humanity being simply unable to pr pr prioritize public good over private profit on the scale required. I mean, I suppose, um, I wonder if I could put another question which sort of leads on from that, which would be mine, which is this uh, one of um, a similar one to do with it, which has always puzzled me. I worked in tax for many, many years. And the one that puzzles me is that at the moment in the UK, um, we have the strange situation that uh, energy consumption gets um, a tax privilege because um, VAT on uh, energy is only 5%. Uh, so in other words, there's a tax incentive in the UK mm -hmm. on consumption of energy. And again, uh, another sort of energy one is that um, when I think it was six or seven years ago, there were the fuel protests about an inflation only increase in fuel duty. Ever since then, no chancellor has ever dared um, uh, mm -hmm. touch, touch this, uh, this issue again. And um, yes, people still uh, talk about the price of fuel because they see it everywhere they drive, but actually in real terms at the moment, fuel is um, a lot cheaper than it has been for, for many, um, for, for quite a wee while. So I don't know whether there's, yeah. um, um, we want it, but not now. So um, we, we seem incapable of identifying a, a path to it um, and prioritizing common good over profit. I agree. And, you know, I, I think the problem is, and, you know, this is why I came back to this language issue. Uh, in, in, in my previous book, I actually opened it up with Plato's, um, you know, given that you're a philosophical society, <laughs> uh, Plato's uh, saying that storytellers rule the world. So the stories we tell determine what we actually do. So if we have a story of government as leveling the playing field, we won't get the kind of tax policies that you're talking about, Richard. We currently have tax policies that A, reward short-term investments over long-term investments. If you look at how capital gains tax is structured or the lack of financial transaction tax, it, it really benefits you if you're, you know, just kind of making money moving around existing assets rather than investing in the kind of, you know, new structures that we need. And second, in terms of the directionality of those structures, you know, greener ones, as you say, we actually tax um, labor more than we tax materials, right? So if you actually want to reduce the material content as the steel example, that I mentioned, you would need to, you know, tax material <laughs> more than other things. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing that. That's an outcome of a decision we've made a society. There's nothing inevitable in that. And that's why I kind of always push back on the degrowth agenda, which almost makes it sound like it's this deterministic boundary that we can't, you know, go over. Um, definitely there's boundaries we can't go over, planetary boundaries. And I really, you know, think Kate Rayworth's work is, is fantastic around that as is Tim Jackson's, but where I sometimes differ 
is it's not because we're growing, it's just very problematic decisions we made of how to structure our tax system, of how to give out, again, grants, loans, and procurement without any sort of conditionality mm -hmm. towards these sustainability targets. Um, and the ultra financialized form of our corporate governance system, which continues to be just, you know, directed at that bottom line of increasing share prices, that could, you know, that could be changed. Just one quick example, Bell Labs, which was one of the most innovative private sector uh, innovation laboratories came about in an era in the United States where the government was confident enough to make it a condition for, for AT&T, which had the monopoly on telecoms, that to retain their monopoly, they had to reinvest their profits into the real economy, into innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms. Bell Labs was the answer to that provocation. So imagine today with all this value extracted out, you know, four trillion in share buybacks and all this short termism, if there was more conditionality in terms of long termism and long termism towards more inc you know, inclusive forms of growth, more sustainable forms of growth, we can do that. Mm -hmm. We just have decided not to. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I suppose um, to follow on that, I just wonder whether the, the model you're comparing is a public uh, company with um, w at the moment. And I just wonder whether there's anything in large privately owned companies. So if you think of the likes of um, Dyson and the vacuum cleaners, um, JCB with their uh, backhoe tractors, um, maybe even things like um, Associated British Foods with many years of control by the Western family. Um, the, these companies, uh, you know, certainly seem to have gone for the long term. Um, so I, I don't know whether it's, um, is, is there a third, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the, the corporate one and the government one, is, is there a third one in the middle or a third one? Yes, I mean, there definitely is. So in fact, in some previous writings, I've written a lot about this idea that there's varieties of capitalism as have, there's all literature on this varieties of capitalism. There's not one way to do corporate governance. That's why this idea of stakeholder governance is important. You know, John Lewis is a cooperative. That's a mm -hmm. particular way to structure a company. We have a project, which I didn't, I didn't have as one of my examples, but it's a project through my institute where we have been working with the uh, region of Biscay in the Basque region of, um, of Spain, because mm. they have this very large cooperative, which is called Mondragon. It's an industrial cooperative, not just a retail one. Most cooperatives now are retail like John Lewis. They have 87,000 workers. They produce, you know, from washing machines, dishwashers, machine tools, et cetera. And the history they have of this deep cooperative John Lewis kind of you know, corporate governance is today uh, informing the way they think about their own green transition. So not just at the corporate governance level, but how different members, different stakeholders outside also of the company negotiate their way through a green transition. And there's ways to do that, but it has to be learning from also how we've have had different business models. It's not just, again, a pie in the sky. There's experiences that we can learn from. In Germany, again, or in Scandinavian countries, they put trade unions on the board of companies. It's still capitalism. It's just a different way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's, there's something about really looking at the heterogeneity of ways to govern our business sector, but also our, our public sector, and mm -hmm. kind of learning what works and what doesn't. And definitely what doesn't is this kind of short-term speculative, you know, just worrying about uh, share prices. That hurts workers, it hurts planet, it even hurts the companies. You know, no one wins. In the long run, those same companies don't benefit. In mm -hmm. the short run, they do. And as long as capital is benefiting from moving it around, you know, quick short-term trades, and if we don't de-reward that, you know, <laughs> penalize that, yeah. by rewarding the kind of behaviors that we want. And that's why we need this concept of tilting the playing field. You need to design a tax system that tilts us in the direction of the kind of growth we want. There's a couple of questions and comments about um, the hollowing out of the expertise in the public sector and um, how this might be um, dealt with. And um, uh, one is, um, um, from uh, Mr. Anonymous again, I know from painful experience that the Royal Navy support organization has attempted many aspects of what you've described starting 12 years ago. It's however failed on many levels. How do you bring something like that back from the brink without legions of management consultants? Yeah. As everything has been outsourced, aimed at shared value, profit and innovation, it didn't work. And the other one 
uh, on a similar vein, should government have a closer alliance with academia, academia and uh, experts such as yourselves in terms of outsourcing for advice rather than profit driven and everly self-serving consultancy giants? Um, is uh, academia set up for that or would it begin to itself become self-serving if used in that way? That's such a good question. Wow, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, how do you say, hang a bit of dirty laundry out on that one. So first of all, that, you know, that point of Lord Agnew that we've infantilized government by outsourcing its brain is, is just so important. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It can't just be solved by saying, stop outsourcing, don't use consulting companies. The reason they're used is this idea that government at best, you know, at worst, it's get the hell out of the way. At best is fix a market failure and then, you know, get out of the way, um, you know, because otherwise you're crowding out business. Um, so as soon as you start saying, actually, the role of the public sector through all its different organizations, whether it's an R&D organization, the BBC or a health organization is about co-creating, you know, the economy, co-creating value, co-shaping markets, then you need particular types of capabilities to do that. So again, the remit defines the kind of, you know, knowledge and capabilities you need. So where, you know, you have a master's in business administration, MBAs, that brag about things like strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior, all these great things that businesses need to think about in order to create value. If you look at the MPA, Masters in Public Administration, not Business Administration curriculums, they are so boring. That's why I set up my institute. We have a whole new curriculum actually for civil servants. Um, it, it has four different modules. One is on value, one is on challenge oriented uh, policy, one is on creative bureaucracies. You know, why is it that when we use the word bureaucracy, we think it's a bad thing? You know, it's so bureaucratic. Well, bureaucratic bureaucratic is just a fact. Things have to be bureaucratic. Is it a creative bureaucracy or an inertial, boring, terrible bureaucracy? Unfortunately, we often have the latter. And the last module is on uh, digital, you know, governing digital uh, platforms in a proactive way. So that's a very different curriculum from the one that globally, whether it's at Harvard or Oxford, is being fed out, which is all based on kind of Chicago kind of economics landed mm -hmm. into the public sector uh, through pub uh, new public management and public choice theory. So we need a new curriculum. And on the, issue of, on the issue of academia, it's really interesting. I mean, I had an experience in Scotland. I hope my uh, Scottish colleagues don't matter, don't mind that I say this, but we work for two years as an academic institution uh, to set up a new Scottish national investment bank, mission oriented, and basically charge the government almost nothing, literally just the cost of the research fellows that were helping me. I think I did it for free, but the research fellows were, you know, had to be paid in terms of hiring them to do this um, at cost, right? So we are a public institution trying to bring our great kind of, you know, thinking to the floor to, you know, impact policy. We did that. And then unfortunately the project management of this bank that we did almost for free was given to PwC. <laughs> I won't tell you exactly how much they were paid, <laughs> but they project managed it. And I remember saying, what the hell? You know, if you wanted to give money, you could have given it to us, but we didn't want to charge you that. But the idea that government is so insecure and mm -hmm. so risk averse that it thinks it needs to outsource the project management to the consulting companies because they don't have the capability went completely against everything we were trying to build. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I mean, I don't want to make a judgment now on the bank itself, which I think is really well structured and there's great things happening there. But the point is, this is all too often happening globally, not mm -hmm. just Scotland, globally, which is, oh, it's just project management, give it to the, but actually managing a project, it's learning by doing. Mm -hmm. Learning by doing means you actually mm -hmm. learn and you learn inside. And if you stop doing and someone else is learning, you become stupider mm -hmm. and stupider. So then the outsourcing becomes an inevitable conclusion of how you frame the problem and how you've then governed it. So it's not just ideological, you know, someone could say it's a, it, it's a neoliberal thing. It becomes inevitable in how you've actually structured the governance. Do you think there's also a sort of perhaps a, um, a thing underlying it? I mean, it used to be in business that there was the saying, you never get, got um, shot for buying IBM. Uh, this is going back a few years, um, I must say. For the, uh, but when, compatible. Um, <laughs> when, um, when IBM ruled the world, Big Blue, 
um, that um, in the same sort of way, um, if you have something like the bank, and in fact, uh, one of the questions is, can you expand on how a Scottish National Investment Bank could have its mission set by the citizens? Uh, would you envisage this being through the Scottish Parliament or other external bodies or boards? But um, which is the question, but um, is there a is there something which I'm not quite sure if it exists so much in business now about you never get fired for buying IBM in the sense in the same way there's a, as you say, a fear um, in um, the, the public sector that um, if we've outsourced it to a big name, um, obviously it's no longer IBM, you replace that with something else, we won't get fired. And, and how do you get rid of that um, mentality? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's two points there. The first is on citizen engagement, and the other one is kind of on the risks that we're willing to take as opposed to de-risking and hiring someone else to do that. So the first is, I, I do think we need to be careful, like pretending that, you know, just using the word citizen engagement, you know, that could just lead to chaos, <laughs> right? So there's something about a very delicate balance between a top-down direction, which it has to be broad, right? You know, top-down, really micromanage fails. That, that doesn't work. That doesn't stimulate innovation. But a top-down decision, we are going to have a green transition. We are going to have sustainability targets of X, Y, and Z. The how will be managed at the local level. You can't just tell a city you're going to be carbon neutral. It's a good thing to do. It needs to be negotiated. What does it mean in particular areas? I mentioned the example of the housing estates in Camden, where we actually need things like citizen assemblies, which in some ways, you know, I mean, one of the good things, I'm, I'm against Brexit, but one of the good things about Brexit was how it kind of, you know, I think stimulated a lot of citizen assemblies to debate it. We often don't have enough debate in our lo lo localities. So what would it mean to bring housing associations and citizen assemblies to the table on how a carbon neutral agenda, which does land top down, but the how, how we're gonna do it, what it means for the design of the homes, of the ways we live together of a public square, gets negotiated and is co-designed by cities. There's really interesting examples of that in Sweden today. We actually work quite closely with the Swedish government around um, some of the missions that they're setting both at the street level in terms of a sustainable uh, a street, in terms of everything that happens, not just on the high street, but literally the 4,000 kilometers of, of streets they have in Sweden, mm -hmm. but also the school meal example I gave before very much was inspired by something that's happening in Sweden. That can't be, again, just fed down when I mentioned that students can come and be part of a school meal agenda to make them you know, healthy, tasty, sustainable, but also help in the monitoring, but also bring it to the curriculum. That's where that engagement is. On the risk, I mean, as soon as you admit that government is also about creating value, learning, taking risks, you need to be able to learn from the inevitable failure. So the first is to admit you're taking risks. The second is that it's going to often mess up. <laughs> and instead mm -hmm. of just plastering your face on the Daily Mail because you messed up, it's part of that process. But if in, in, on the way you haven't learned from messing up and the failure, you've really failed. Like the failure is not from failing, which is inevitable. The failure is if you haven't invested within your organization to learn by doing, right? And so that's that self-fulfilling prophecy I mentioned that if you're not seen as an active member of society and just at best a facilitator, there isn't that incentive to invest and you fear that failure. So it's easier to outsource it to someone else. So if things go wrong, oh, it's their fault. But then you've just completely missed out on the learning along the way. And that inevitable, you know, and that's the self-fulfilling. You then kind of become stupid because you're not learning. And then actually the outsourcing happens because you're incapable, <laughs> yeah. not just because there's a, a, an ideology against you. Yes. And I suppose there's the other thing, as you say, the, the news media will always um, try and find a way to um, throw mud at somebody and, and the poor civil servant you feel fear feel sometimes for them because um if something is tremendously successful um like the uh, as you say the vaccine uh, program then uh, the ministers will be uh, first um to to take uh, credit for that and i think there was i can't remember now there was quite an extreme example of that that he backtracked about uh, about that but if um if it um, if it doesn't work out, then uh, the minister says, "Well, that was nothing to do with me. That was the um, the civil service that caused the problem." Um, yeah. And um, so um, again, um, there's a bit of human nature, I think, um, sculling around the background, and that um, little ogre would have to be somehow, I, I think, addressed. And uh, as you say, as you precisely as you say. Um, 
in, in doing risky things, you have to accept the possibility of failure, but I'm not quite sure how you deal with it. Anyway, um, uh, another um, question, which is this time from uh, Colin Brown. Uh, when Scott government tried to reform the private um, PFI or PPI contracts, uh, they were unable to control profit taking uh, by the profits private sector in the long term. Commercial confidentiality hides this. How can the government enforce access to the full accounts of private organisations? It contracts with on a sustainable cost plus basis, um, uh, which um, uh, I, I don't know. Is it um, another um, little um, problematic area? Um, yeah, I mean, that's why I focus on that example of how, you know, we got to the moon by actually caring about that mm. question. That question mm. was in the minds of the NASA, you know, people mm. uh, who were working with the private sector, and yet we don't have that. And so many, you know, the PFI schemes have just gone so wrong, or even, you know, I, I sometimes like where I think Corbyn got it wrong in terms of a kind of a progressive ideology, which we should have had in the Labour Party is it's, it's not about ownership. It's not just about nationalizing, you know, stuff, nationalizing, mm -hmm. transport, nationalizing, whatever it may be. It's about getting the right deal, you know. So if you are going to let the private sector to come into the, you know, what was before publicly funded and governed transport system, thinking of trains and Virgin Atlantic, you better make sure there's very clear criteria mm -hmm. Of, of you know what's going to be required you know sustainable modern fast uh, accessible uh, transport system in terms of the prices and if you don't embed that into the contract it's not going to happen right mm -hmm. and so um, I, I think it's, it's just you know unfortunately in, in Scotland for example one of the reasons we argue that a public bank was needed was precisely by looking at how much could have been saved uh, mm. by the government had it actually just funded and governed some of the systems directly instead of indirectly in this intermediated way from a very cost inflated uh, mm. a, a privately dominated system but the second point is well if you do bring in the private sector which of course should come in in, in many different areas what is the relationship? What's the governance structure? What's that contract? So I think you need both. You need, mm -hmm. in some cases, you just need that public financial institutions like a public bank. But if you don't have that, you can still have, you know, a government led uh, deal, which is again, symbiotic when you do open up an area to the private sector it has to be very clear what the target is, you know, going to the moon and back was the target back then. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just come in and do what you want. We need to commercialize space. No, <laughs> if you just say commercialize space, you get what we have today, which is all these astronauts complaining, they cannot see a thing. They're like, we can't see anything anymore because there's all this garbage. Astronomers, debris. the astronomers, yeah, yes. The astronomers are saying there's all this debris, <laughs> right? All this debris, yeah, sorry, astronomers, uh, in, in space because you know the Elon Musks who've invested <laughs> on the back of a public infrastructure, there's no deal, there's no criteria, there's no regulation. So there's lots of garbage up there, you know, in terms of all the different satellites and it's too much. It's not regulated in a way that you can plan for the kind of space economy that we want. And I think the, the other aspect of, of going on from uh, the, the question that Mr. Brown asked there, the um, uh, sadly, the, um, the whole thing of getting uh, the accountants again, getting stuff off balance sheet. Um, yeah. Now, um, the, the question of off balance sheet financing in companies that um, rogue was dealt with many years ago. And if a company engages in off balance sheet um, accounting, certainly in the UK, maybe not in the United States of America, which we saw in the Enron collapse, but anyway, yeah. in the UK, um, accounting standards would force companies to recognize quasi loans and quasi debt. But um, the public sector has been resolute in its refusal to adopt um, the uh, the full gamut of um, accounting for off balance sheet, and I think this has ended up with the public sector getting some very bad deals because I they agree. can um, get um, quasi borrowing expensively from the private sector, yeah. um, whereas they could get public debt very cheaply, but that would appear as debt in their balance sheet. But the quasi debt with the private sector, because I say they've resisted adopting the full uh, rigor of um, accounting standards. So again, that's, yeah. that's a topic Richard, for another day, I think. Yeah, Richard, do you work on this? 
Uh, no, I worked in tax, but um, okay. I, I, I worked with um, colleagues that worked with it and it always intrigued me, perhaps because of my... Um, it's so strange interesting. Interest in, strange interest in tax that um, it always puzzled me, the economics, which just did not make sense one little bit to me well, of the... Uh, yeah of the public sector borrowing so expensively when the public yeah. sector has got the access access to the cheapest debt so why would you go and of course the answer is um they body swerve the the full rigors of accounting standards so um i mean that's uh, but that's rather arcane and, and uh, but actually arcane though it may be it's it's what is the root in my mind of, of the problems that we've ended up it's such a good point. So I'm, I'm going to say this in front of all the, what is it, 100 and something people listening. Let's write something up together because that point that you've just made is crucial. It's actually a global point. You have so many government budgets, which everyone worries about, being inflated due to that. So it's not only like, oh, don't worry about the budget. Actually, what you need to care about is the mission and then you know, let the financing come out later. And if you don't think like that, ironically, your budget actually goes up because you're doing everything mm -hmm. kind of wrong, but also in terms of actually thinking how you're financing really important kind of, you know, public enterprises or, or projects or again, missions does matter. And we've just gotten so terribly wrong and it ends up making it look like the government is investing more than it actually is mm -hmm. <laughs> because of how it's being financed. Mm -hmm. And then you get these cuts and austerity on the back of that. And it's just like this loop. Um. I think we've got time for two more. Uh, I've got one here from Julie. Thank you for such a stimulating talk. I really like the analogy to the mission to the moon. My question is, is there a country in the world today that you might use as a role model or moving towards being a role model that could be held up as an example of your strategic approach? Uh, what would be the five? Asking for five, there we are, the five, not three, but five lessons you think we can learn from the UK handling of the COVID pandemic and Brexit. So uh, can you deal with that in two minutes? Yeah, I mean, I've already mentioned some interesting examples. Definitely Sweden right now, which has this mission, which is about a fossil free welfare state, I find interesting because it means that everything the government does from housing to transport to public education and public health has that mission of carbon neutrality and fossil freeness at the center of it. And because all of that is delivered also with partnership with business, it just becomes very concrete and it lands on specific places like streets and school meals. Um, the lessons, I don't know if it's gonna be five, I'll just kind of you know, list them. First of all, if you've just over the last 10 years demolished your public health system, you're gonna have a problem when you then have a health crisis. <laughs> uh, so unless you really make sure that the stimulus itself, which we have now is strengthening that public health system, you're going to get a, you're going to still have a problem in the next health crisis, and unfortunately, there will be other pandemics. So, first lesson is don't demolish the welfare state, re, you know, rejuvenate it, revive it, reimagine it. And on health, God, is that important? Also, globally, global health systems are important. Had this crisis begun in Africa and not China, we would all be worse off. Uh, second is that kind of you know, need to govern this crisis in a capable, agile, flexible way, you, you can't outsource that, right? So that difference between how the vaccine was rolled out through the public health system versus the Deloitte way, in, or not just Deloitte, I shouldn't keep bashing in Deloitte, but anyway, consultis, consultification, infantilization way that we did the test and trace system, that's already a really big lesson. And the vaccine rollout has just been really inspiring. I got my vaccine last uh, week, I'm not sure. I didn't jump the queue. I somehow just got there because we're vaccinating so many people. And I almost felt like crying just to see how well it was organized and just how nested within the community. Mm -hmm. um, third, I think the whole vaccine thing, you know, as great as it is that we have an Oxford vaccine in the UK. So, you know, that'll be more kind of national. We can't have a nationalistic approach to the vaccine. It's a global pandemic. We really need to do what the World Health Organization is talking about, which is preventing vaccine apartheid. Um, we need to govern the intellectual property rights. It's interesting, AstraZeneca and the Oxford model was very different from the Pfizer one. They actually negotiated that the price had to be remain low for the AstraZeneca one, whereas Pfizer, which is, I've written about Pfizer for the last 20 years, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it is a very financialized company. It's, it's not a coincidence that that wasn't negotiated. Mm -hmm. Uh, God, I think I'm only on three. I don't think that matters. Yeah. Does it? That's, oh, well, that's a, it's I've a got, good three. Thank you very much. And I, I think, I think in, <laughs> oh, and in, don't, in, don't yeah. now, sorry, really important because we put all this money in, the furlough schemes, et cetera, 
please don't go back to austerity because we think we need to pay it back. Yeah. That's not true for the public sector. It's true for the private sector. You need to eventually pay back a loan. It's not true for governments. We need to really learn the lessons of what it means you know, in the same way that we created all this money, whether it's going to war or to fight this pandemic, we need to ask ourselves, what is money for? What is finance for? And not worry about the bottom line for the government, but make sure it's actually investing in that structural long-term, you know, strategic mission oriented way to catalyze all this innovation across the economy. And that's gonna keep actually eventually the debt to GDP in check because it's gonna keep that denominator, you know, going in the right direction. Thank you. I think you've answered one or two of the other questions Good. on the We're way done. through there. So thank you very much. <laughs> and the last uh, question, perhaps uh, um, from um, uh, uh, I don't know whether it, he might be uh, might be the youngest uh, participant or anyway. Greetings to Dr. Matsukato and the Royal Philosophical Society. Speaking as an economic student, I'm curious about what changes you believe should be made in undergraduate and postgraduate economics teaching so that students may better understand these new concepts from Bernardo Almeida. So um, uh, the last question, if you can, a quick thought to yeah. uh, Bernardo. So the quick question is, I've actually written um, a book called Rethinking Capitalism. We have a course on it at University College London. The curriculum and the videos are all free on the web actually. Um, and it's all there, the answers are there. But what we do in the course is we break down, you know, what do we understand about what makes companies competitive? You know, it's actually not about perfect competition theory. It's about these long run investments. And that requires a different theory of organizational competence from those that we learn about in neoclassical economics with the representative agents and perfect competition theory. Equally, we need a very different understanding on the government side, which I've already talked about. It's not about fixing markets, but co-creating and co-shaping. Um, and everything along the way, you know, what is money, what is finance, it's not just a medium of exchange, money is not neutral, finance is not neutral, how we finance stuff actually then affects what happens, right, so this non neutrality of finance is a very critical uh, part of rethinking capitalism and the economy and economics, which is not in the curriculum often. Um, but yeah, the quick answer is go to our textbook called Rethinking Capitalism and the course called Rethinking Capitalism at my Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, and there'll be some answers there for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Good. thank you I, ever so much. Um, I need to go feed my quite, children. <laughs> yes, quite, a, quite an evening. We better let you get away. But anyway, um, if anybody who's uh, been on tonight is wanting to look into some of the issues that uh, Professor Matsukato has um, been going on, I, has been not going on, <laughs> we have been covering I have, I have been going on, going going on. on. ranting. Um, I can recommend um, her book, um, uh, the mission economy and certainly it's uh, a very uh, stimulating uh, read and um, I think uh, one of the um, the ones uh, one of the things that struck me in reading the book was towards the end how um, again she said that um, women women put life at the center of the economy uh, not the economy at the center of life was how she ends up her uh, how she concludes her book and I think um, uh, I think uh, putting life at the centre of the economy is certainly something we should be striving for. So, um, wow, what an evening. Thank you very much for Thank putting you. us in between all your busy activities and your uh, children. So um, I hope the uh, Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow won't be a bad word uh, amongst the, the family tonight. Um, no, no, it'll be good. And, uh, <laughs> and it's been a, a, a tremendous privilege having you with us tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Goodbye.